Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, one of the things we look at is the compatibility between LED lights and dimmers. Sometimes it's a good relationship, sometimes not so good. Some of the things that you need to look at will be able to cover that as well. Also, a lot of people are staying away from their regular gym and working out at home. How feasible is it to create a space in your home as your own personal gym? We'll give you some things to consider there. Toilet problems certainly plague a lot of people and cause a lot of um, people money in that water bill. Uh, There's some simple ways to correct that. And when you're putting away that patio furniture, don't just put it away for the winter. Do a few things to make sure it looks good in the spring. And I've got a simple solution on how to clean dirty, grungy grout using not a grout cleaner, but something you might have in your home right now. There you go. This and a whole lot more coming right up. Right now we're going to head right to Virginia. Leilani is joining us today. Hey, welcome to the show. Hi, um, I'm in Virginia. My name is Lonnie, and thank you for taking my call. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with some recessed lights. I have hand lights or recessed lights in my kitchen. They're nine, and they're all on a dimmer switch. So they come on at the same time. Never had any problems with it. I had two of the canned lights changed by an electrician, and uh, he put in pendant um, light fixtures. And when he went up in the wall, he said he didn't have to add any uh, new electrical wiring or anything. He just had to move, I guess, the um, the whatever it is in the wall mm-hmm. that holds the electrical, you know, fixture mm-hmm. uh, in sync with the other lights. Right. So everything mm-hmm. is still on the same switch. Okay. But now, uh, occasionally when I turn the lights on, the pendant lights delay coming on. And I never had that happen with any of the canned lights um, in that group. And sometimes it doesn't come on at all. And then I cut the switch off and turn it back on. And then the pendant lights will pop on. Okay. So I don't know exactly what's going on. I still have the holes in my wall because I'm afraid to close up the old hole because he had to move those fixtures uh, to center over an island. So I'm not sure what's going on. And I'm like, do I have a safety hazard here, a fire hazard? Like, what's going on? Okay. I, I don't know if it may necessarily be a um, any kind of a safety hazard. It is kind of an odd thing. But a lot of times this type of situation involves a dimmer not being exactly compatible with an LED type of light. And do you know if uh, when those pendants were put up, were they uh, LEDs or incandescent? Well. I asked my husband, and he said that he made all the light bulbs the same. And they're not the same brand, but they're all dimmable, incandescent, 60-watt bulbs. Now, the ones that are in the canned fixtures are the ones that kind of span out. You know, they're kind of an A-shape, or they they fan out. And the ones in the pendant, they're just round light bulbs. I see, I see. And but it would really be unusual to use an incandescent this day and time. Um, I'm just wondering if there is a compatibility there. Joe, what do you what do you think on that? Because I would certainly think if it's a new fixture, it almost has to be um, LED these days. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, Lonnie. Any new fixture would almost certainly be LED. Um, and the, the when they first came out with LED lights, Almost none of the existing dimmer switches would would operate them. I mean, they wouldn't operate at all. And okay. then manufacturers came out with switches that were supposed to be compatible, and sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't, because the whole industry between okay. the, the the light bulbs or the light fixtures being new and then trying to catch up with the switches, there was a short period of time, maybe a year or so, before they got it right. I know that because um, there's a there's a microprocessor inside the dimmer switches, and they they don't always play well. With the LEDs, I know Lutron okay. had one that uh, didn't work, and they had to switch it to a new one. And the new ones are called Diva or Skylark, I think, are the two models. Um, but in any case, if you got a newer dimmer switch that 
is absolutely compatible with LEDs, that should solve the problem. It shouldn't have anything to do with the wiring. It shouldn't have anything. I don't think it's de defective or dangerous or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm guessing that, as Danny suggested, it's probably the, the dimmer switch is the issue, not the fixtures or the wiring. My pendant lights are new. My uh, can lights are 30 years old. I mean, it was with the original house. Uh, what I would suggest is replacing the old can lights with an LED retrofit. You can get a, You don't have to change out anything except what you see when you look up at the ceiling. You just pull out what's there. The old can stays in place. The wiring stays in place. And you can buy. Ask the electrician to bring you um, the LED retrofit kits. And you just screw it in. You just screw it in just like a light bulb, and it snaps in place. And it'll look like. Uh, it'll probably look very similar to what you have now, but it'll be an LED. And now you have all LED with the right dimmer switch. Everything will be compatible, and I suspect this issue um, will disappear. And yeah, boy, Joe, that's good advice for anybody that has the old-fashioned recess cans. Boy, they're just like little heat lamps, you know. They 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 just and they'll burn those bulbs up, and they they're just not good at all. So it is so simple just to um, really release those and then just screw those LED conversion kits up in there. And that and that's true if you're having any trouble with um, dimmer switches and lights. There's a couple things to think about. First of all, this more uh, current issue with the um, incompatibility of of a, a dimmer switch and and bulbs, um, you know, you can get past, past that. And again, Lutron or Leviton has a great dimmer switch that'll get you past that. But um, you, you really, sooner or later, every one of those lights in your house are going to be LED. You might as well That's right. go ahead and make that uh, make that bit of a conversion there. And it's, uh, you know, um, the LED lights, just like so many things that are introduced into the building world, boy, they've really come down in price. I'll tell you, when they were first being hyped and I saw a floodlight bulb for $68. I said, I, know. I don't know. I don't know about the future of this of this system. Yeah, well, it was like anything else when it first comes out, right? I mean, if there's only a few of them, the technology is not, not everybody's making them. There might, might only be one or two manufacturers, but over time, the price comes down and down until, you know, everyone's buying them. And yeah, they're pretty affordable now, especially if you buy them in a pack. I have never bought in the last two years, I've never bought a single LED bulb, unless mm -hmm. it's a specialty bulb for someplace. If you buy them in a pack, they're pretty affordable, and um, and you know they last almost forever. And by the way, we're calling them a bulb because everybody calls them LED bulbs. There's no light bulb involved in an LED fixture. It's a light-emitting diode. That's what it stands for. And this is why they can make them so small, because there is no bulb. It's just this right. little tiny thing that lights up, and it produces an amazing amount of really bright, white, clean light. But, you know, if you have a, a large room and you may have um, six, eight, ten recessed lights, and over the years, you know, you've replaced this one with this and this one with this, and you right, look up yeah. there, and it's just a hodgepodge of different color temperatures and so forth. Yep. Let me tell you, I had that in, in my office, and it drove me crazy. So I took every one of them out, and I put these new LED lights in there, and I saved yep. the other bulbs to use here and there and other fixtures. And everybody that walks into my office is like, whoa, wow, you know, yep. I mean, it's just the the – it's just a feel-good light. It's really, you know, it's bright enough, but it's pleasant enough. So a great way to go and well worth a modest investment. Harriet in Massachusetts asks, I was putting away our aluminum patio furniture for the winter and noticed that the table and chairs are badly faded and they're, uh, they look very dull and chalky. What can I do to make them look cleaner and newer when I break them out in the spring? Um, should I have them stripped and repainted? By the way, the furniture set wasn't cheap, and it's only three years old. Please help. Okay. So we know exactly what they're talking about, the yeah. chalky and oxidation and everything that takes place like that. And uh, But I'll tell you what, the aluminum furniture like that, I have I have some um, down at my beach place, and I'm telling you, um, a can of spray paint goes a long way. Now, yeah, you have to clean it well. Right. Let me rephrase that. A can of spray paint can go a long way to improve the look of furniture. Right. It can also go a long way if there's a slight wind. Uh-oh. <laughs> what else did you paint? The adjacent um, sliding glass door. Oh, no. Um, but it's glass. It's easy to clean, though it's um, <laughs> like 12 by 15. So what Danny's suggesting is bring the furniture to your neighbor's house and spray <laughs> yeah. paint it. 
uh, be careful of the wind. But I'll tell you what, that um, we actually use, you know, they have a spray paint now that is a hammered finish. Yes. And I don't know how it does it, but it creates a, almost a texture, which most of the cast aluminum type um, furniture has. And uh, I mean, and then all of the different colors, the bronze and the different things like that. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, right now, before you really get into the thick of winter, uh, you'll be really glad if you took the time to do that. Now, um, I took a, a sponge sander and sanded all of my surfaces down. Of course, it creates a tremendous amount of dust that you need to get off with a tack rack and clean it off really, really well. Matter of fact, after I did all of my sanding, I actually took a water hose and just watered it and just blew all of that dust off, allowed it to dry. And then, of course, with any kind of spray paint, you don't want to, you know, get it too heavy. Real light coats and just take your time. Make sure you're, you know, got some good light on it and everything. But, Joe, I think uh, Harriet should should go ahead and do that. I don't think they have to strip the actual paint off. Just make sure any of the flaking and any of the powder and the chalkiness is off of it. But, um, I mean, especially she's talking about it being only three years old. She could paint that, allow it to dry well, store it, and then when she breaks it out in the spring, it'll look awesome. Yeah, exactly. Especially since she doesn't mention, she doesn't say that the paint is badly chipping or, or, or blistering off. She simply says that it's uh, faded and chalky. So that absolutely can clean it. In fact, there's another product she could try if she doesn't even want to paint it first. You might want to try this first because it often will do a a really nice job of cleaning up um, aluminum that's been badly weathered. It's it's simply called All New, A-L hyphen N-E-W, All New um, Aluminum Restoration Kit. It comes in a kit. It's about $35 or so. And basically it just, and it comes with with sponges and microfiber cloths and all this and it, but it comes with this solution that you just wipe it on that's all you just squirt a little of this material on wipe it and that's it and what it does it leaves behind a clear uh, protective coating that prevents corrosion and it cleans off uh, the chalking and any fading that Harriet was concerned with. So you might want to try that first. And if that doesn't work, then you can go to paint it because it'd be a lot quicker. Might not even need to paint it and everything by getting that oxidation off. Time for our best new product segment brought to you by the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Now, if you're looking for ways to make life easier, this may be the toy for you. This cellular shade motorization kit from Home Decorators Collection converts manual shades to motorized shades with just a few simple steps. The motor is powered by an integrated 4-volt lithium-ion battery, which controls the shades up to a year before it needs to be recharged with the wall adapter. Now, you can communicate with the motor module with Bluetooth technology using the smartphone app, the remote control, or with the press of a button on the electronic end cap. The remote will control up to six motorized shades independently or simultaneously, and the app will allow you to program the shades to automatically move to custom positions based on schedules you create. Now, for more information on this pretty unique shade motorization kit, check it out at homedepot.com. On the hotline right now is J.K. from Connecticut with a fantastic question. Welcome to the show. Thanks, uh, Danny, and and, uh, hello to you and uh, Joe. Uh, So I have kind of a broad question. Uh, About six months ago, six months ago, my uh, gym here in Connecticut closed. So uh, I've been interested in uh, building, and I've done a little research uh, online, building a basically a home gym. I see a lot of people call it a garage gym. And uh, I, I, I'd like to go forward, and I wanted to find out what advice you may have for me as I, as I start planning this out. Okay. All right. Well, I can uh, certainly help you on that. Um, the timing, Jay, is perfect because Danny just moved his garage gym <laughs> to a new home, right? <laughs> Exactly right. Um, in, in my previous house, I had um, a two-car garage that I eventually turned into a gym and put a lot of machines in there and so forth. Um, when I moved to my new place, I have a smaller place, but I still basically did the same thing. But I'll, I'll tell you, when we're talking about uh, surfaces and talking about, first of all, the flooring, tell you something I found that's just about as good as it gets, and it's commercial 
carpet that comes in two foot by two foot squares. You probably see them everywhere and may not realize it, but boy, the installation of these things is so easy. They're not very expensive, and it's just about the most durable flooring I have ever seen because in my previous place, we had, um, since it was an old garage, that was also our entrance right through diagonally was the walkway to get from inside the house to um, outside. And so I, I thought for sure that there would be a tremendous wear pattern, but after about three or four years, you couldn't see any wear pattern at all. So it's great for the weights and for walking and to keep it clean. So that would be a strong recommendation there, um, going with those type of squares, because it's, you know, it's very tight knit and um, you can get some pretty cool colors if you want to kind of jazz it up a little bit. But um, that's what I would, that's what I would recommend on that. And for me, I also, you know, love music, and um, so I, I had four speakers I put in there and a nice little tuner and receiver that I could use. I think that's a good suggestion. And and then, um, right. I, you know, I actually had a remodeling project where the, uh, a lady had a wall of mirrors that she wanted us to take down, and I knew just the place for those things to go. So we carefully right. removed those, and I reinstalled them on the gym. So, you know, keeping your eye out and maybe even looking on um, Craigslist or some of those places for someone that maybe is discarding some of those that you can use, um, not, a, not a bad way to go either. All right, great, great ideas. Uh, one question on the flooring. This will be on a porch slab, which I imagine you had in your garage. Did you have any issues with you know dropping a weight and cracking with concrete, or you know, would you recommend a rubber uh, surface under that carpet? What it, how'd you handle that? Well, that's another option. Is the the interlocking rubber floors that are available mm-hmm. for um, for garages? We've installed uh, uh, several of those, and man, they're really they're really cool. But a couple things. Well, one, it's fairly expensive, and two, I always mm-hmm. worry about trapping in, in a floor like that trapping moisture or something trapping mm. underneath there uh it was a little hard i mean now of course they say well you just lift it up and clean it but that's not as easy as it sounds especially when you have a lot of um you know exercise equipment around there but i think um using some of the overlay pads the exercise pads that are that are the thick dense rubber in those areas where the weights might be hitting the floor on a regular basis probably not a bad thing to have on top of the carpet as well Right. Okay. Uh, one last quick question. If I'm attaching a, uh, a pull-up bar or any equipment to a, uh, a stud wall, uh, do you think a two-by-four stud wall, interior wall, is sufficient, or would it need more blocking or, or something? Is, is that a problem? Um, well, I mean, if you, if you, long as you, of course, are screwing, bolting right into the, the wood studs, it'd probably be fine. But I, what I would do is I'd put a, maybe like a two by six or something like that across the wall and mm. double, triple bolt that through three or two or three or four Got studs, it. you know, and then right. hang anything off of that. And just getting back to your floor for one second, since you, it sounds like you're going to be using free weights, dense rubber right. would be the way to go because it's the most durable mm. and shock absorbent. And a really affordable thing to use, Jay, is go to like a tractor supply or a place like that mm. and get and get horse horse stall mats. Hmm. Ah, they're okay. three they're All three right. quarter inch thick. And they're four by six foot, and they're only about thirty-five, thirty-six dollars a piece. And a lot of weight rooms, that's what they're using. They're three quarters inch thick, and you can double them up if you need to. And you can use those for you can make a dead deadlift platform out of plywood, and then ah. put these on the sides, and uh, and that you might find will protect the floor and protect the weights. You know, I'm dropping the weights on the concrete. Right, right. Well, that's great, guys. Great, great advice. I really, right. really appreciate it. Our so, pleasure. Good luck Jay, with that, Jay. Get out there and okay. get pump, pumped up and shake off some of that uh, pandemic <laughs> weight. <did you? laughs> you, you got it, man. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate, appreciate the advice. Okay, we'll go to our next caller. This is George from California. Hello. I was watching one of your shows where you used a uh, four-inch inline duct fan to boost the exhaust of a rose dryer vent. And the duct fan had a pressure switch that automatically started the fan when the clothes dryer started. Can you give me information on how to purchase one of those, please, or the make and model? Thank you. 
All righty. Well, uh, certainly, George, uh, that was one of the uh, that was a, a situation I had at the house I just recently sold. And what it was is uh, when the house was originally built, the ductwork for the dryer went in the slab and traveled quite a ways. Well, when you have that, it just doesn't work well. It's really better any time that you can have that dryer to um, exhaust straight to the outside. But the the laundry room was in the center of the house, so I was uh, you know I was kind of hit with uh, what would I do? So I found out about this inline dryer booster fan. So I did a little research on it, and let me tell you, it works extremely well. Um, basically, I, um, which is not usually done where you vent your dryer vertically, especially going through uh, a run that goes through a large attic. So I'm talking about a 20-something foot run with this 4-inch dryer vent. Well, if it would didn't have the, the, the booster um, fan in the middle of it, um, it would never work. The lint would just fall all right back down, I would have all kinds of problems. So I installed this cautiously to make sure that it works. And basically, when the dryer turns on and starts exhausting the air, it automatically comes on, has a relay to boost it. Let me tell you, it was taking me about an hour and a half to dry a load of clothes. This knocked it down to 42 minutes. It wow. is just an amazing thing. You can see this video if you go to todayshomeowner.com and put in inline dryer booster fan. Um, or dryer booster fan, you'll be able to see exactly what it is, how it's installed, and how simple it is in order to really boost that. You're talking about saving a lot of money uh, drying those clothes at 42 minutes versus an hour and a half. Yeah, you're going to save a lot of money. So, George, you can uh, find that. The model number and name, I'm not exactly sure on. I would have to crawl up in the attic to find out. But, um, but First, you'd you, have to get invited into the house. And I'd have to get invited it. because I just sold the house. So that'd be a little, <laughs> a little weird. Excuse me, can I get back in my old attic um but uh you'll be able to find one they're they're very very um easy to obtain and find out so let's go to another caller right now dennis in vermont um i've got a house that was built in about the 40s and a garage uh, attached to it and the floor is quite uh no water issues but the floor is quite uh cracked and pitted um a couple of potholes in the garage maybe like you know three or four inches deep uh just very uneven and i'm looking to like resurface it, um, you know, to fill the cracks with with a product uh, or to go over it. And I was thinking like maybe stay mat or crushed stone and then go over it with a resurfacing uh, material. But I wasn't really sure how to go about, um, you know, taking that on. Any products you recommend or, or uh, methods to kind of recode that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it sounds like, first of all, it sounds like this garage floor is a bit of a mess, and hopefully you can save it. Um, but a resurfacer is the way to go. But first, you're going to have to fill all the cracks and the holes. Um, holes that deep, you probably should fill with concrete. I mean, I'm assuming there's some gravel in there. If you're seeing bare dirt, then yeah, you can put in a couple inches of gravel, then pour in some concrete, level it up. And then for smaller holes and pitting and wider cracks, you can take the resurfacing product and mix it a little thicker than recommended and use that as a patching compound. And then once everything's dry and clean, then you can go over the entire floor um, with a resurfacer. And we often recommend Recap, R-E-C-A-P, um, from QuickRete. Um, and there are plenty of videos online. You can see how it works. But that's what I would recommend. This way, you're ending up with a really nice, clean surface to start with. If done properly, it almost looked like a brand new concrete floor. Yeah, I'll tell you what, and if you do that, that way you get a good smooth surface. And I got to say, I uh, just uh, experienced um, uh, putting Deitch coatings in my garage. Oh, did you? And in my toy barn. And I'm telling you, I wish I, wish I could show you a picture of it right now. It looks like a really cool high-end floor, which it is. But uh, the durability is skid resistant, um, kind of has a faux finish to it, marbleized kind right. of a look to it. And, you know, I put two coats of epoxy on top of it. And and wow. I can't wait till uh, tomorrow when I can get out and start building my workshop, building my workbench, and putting my shelves in. And so that's going to be the floor of the workshop. Not you don't be driving vehicles in here, will you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a you, oh, can you drive did the whole four, barn. Yeah, you can drive forklifts on it. I did my whole entire toy barn, my garage, everything, and uh, it looks fantastic. I'll oh, have good. to post a picture of uh, of what it looked like there. I've got a before and after. What color did you choose? Uh, well, it's um, kind of um, a little bit of little bit gray and a little right. bit of taupe color that's all kind of faux finished all together and then uh, it has a uh, an anti-skid surface on it and then i put the two coats of 
a gloss epoxy on it. Clear give it that epoxy, right? Clear yeah. epoxy that give it, you know, gives it that depth in the color and all of it. How'd you put it on? With a roller or just squeegee a it on? Roll, we rolled and rolled and rolled. But but they actually, Deitch Coating has a special textured roller that right. has like, what what's that stuff called? Chamois cloth or something oh, like chamois, that? Oh, chamois, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, chamois. And you, and you have, it was like little pieces that were screwed to a roller to right. create the texture and the faux finish. Huh. And then you had two colors that you put on that mingled them all together. Wow. I was I was literally an artist out yeah. in my garage. It, just, it was just like beautiful. Picasso. Van Gogh. Yeah. Van Gogh with two ears. It was great, <laughs> man. It was... <laughs> now it's time for a simple solution. All right, Danny. Earlier I had sort of uh, teased you with a way to clean grout without using a grout cleaner. Sure, there are plenty of products, especially products on the market specifically formulated for cleaning dirty, grungy tile grout, but you might just have something in your home right now that works just as well, and it's toilet bowl cleaner. That's right, if you have liquid toilet bowl cleaner, comes in a little squeeze bottle, Lysol has one, Clorox has one as well, and has usually has a little bent nozzle on it, so that I guess the idea is you can reach up underneath the rim of the toilet. But it has an excellent cleaning properties. It usually has some kind of bleach in it. And all I have to do is just squirt a bead of liquid toilet bowl cleaner along the grout joint, wait two or three minutes, and wipe it off with a scouring sponge. That's it. Man. And if you do that regularly, now depending on how many people live in a house and how busy that room is, but even in a busy bathroom, if you did that you know, once every two months, you probably wouldn't even need to do it that often, you'd, be, you'd keep it clean and it wouldn't get so badly stained. But try that if you have some... Toilet bowl cleaner at home, and you have some dirty grout, try the cleaner. I'm sure it'll work. Well, that's a great idea. I have not heard of that, but I can see where it would work very, very well, considering what it's designed for. A great way to go. And, boy, you hit on something there, too, is uh, uh, cleaning on a regular basis. If that grout really gets bad, uh, you you can get it cleaner, but you may not get it back like you want. So that's a good thing to do on a regular basis. And after you have cleaned it really, really well, remember, sealing grout is a great way to repel those stains and a fairly easy little project that you can do. Do without uh, spending a lot of time and certainly a lot of money. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. This one comes from Shirley in North Carolina. We have a wine cellar in our basement with block walls that in spite of applying moisture-proof sealing are still peeling and flaking and they look just terrible. What can we do? Well, Joe, it certainly is a result of some moisture getting in there and uh, moisture seeping its way in there. What are some of the steps you would uh, recommend for Shirley to solve that problem? Well, I mean, if there's excessive moisture, I mean, you really should solve that problem first because I'm not sure. There are products that are supposed to be guaranteed, but I'm not sure how well they work. I would start with Dry Lock. If you went to drylock.com, and that's D-R-Y-L-O-K, and they have a whole line of, of full line of waterproofing products, and I would probably start with their highest grade product, which is called Dry Lock Extreme. It's supposed to be guaranteed to stop water. I'm not sure how they can make that guaranteed. And it withstands 15 pounds of hydrostatic pressure. And according to Dry Lock, that's equivalent to a wall of water 33 feet high. Wow. So I don't know how they come up with all this. These engineers are amazing. Um, it's about $140 for five gallons, so it's not terribly expensive. Um, but if you need to step up, then you have to go to a commercial product. Now, one that I've used in the past is called Lastiseal, and that's L A S T I. S E A L, last to seal, and it's a brick and concrete sealer. It's a little more expensive, about $44 a gallon. I think uh, it comes in a five gallon bucket for about $220. But there's not a paint, it's actually a poly- polyester polymer waterproofing sealer. And you just brush it on, it seeps. They say it seeps like three or four inches into the concrete. I'm not sure how that's possible. But it seeps in, it just encapsulates it. And that's supposed to really block moisture as well. Now, this is assuming the the excessive moisture Shirley is experiencing is coming through the wall. It might be coming through cracks at the bottom of the wall or the top of the mm-hmm. wall or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. So um, th- that's what I recommend. You can try the, the dry lock pro- and you can buy a smaller can of the dry lock and just try it in one area and see if it works. But it's, it's definitely, as you suggested, it's definitely a moisture problem. 
And real important to get that surface ready, though, because you probably have some efflorescence on it. You probably have some chalky powder on that surface of the concrete or concrete block, whatever you have. So um, scrape as much of it as you can off and uh, then grab the TSP, trisodium phosphate, mix it properly and use the proper precautions in using it and then clean that clean that wall really, really well, scrape it as much as you can. Then uh, maybe put a fan on it for uh, maybe a full day and let it dry out as much as you can before you apply any of the waterproofing. But uh, um, without a doubt, that'll improve it drastically. And Shirley, thank you so much for that email. And you can send us one anytime and possibly be our question of the week here on the Today's Homeowner podcast by sending it to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast each week. You know, it's so gratifying to see um, our uh, downloads going up every single week and has for ever since we relaunched the uh, the podcast uh, about a year ago. And we'd love to hear from you as well. If you have any suggestions, comments that can make this uh, serve you better, then just let us know and you can send those emails as well. Again, todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. And thanks for the continued great reviews that we're getting wherever you download your podcast. I'm Danny Lipford along with my buddy Joe Truini and thanks again for listening to this Today's Homeowner Podcast.